Welcome back everyone, I'm the Bella Gamer, and today's video is very special because it is the climax of a recent competition that we've done here with our community. If you've been watching our recent table talks, or if you're in our Discord, you might have noticed that we've been doing a special uh, build contest for people in our Discord, where they got to do some builds, and then we set some of these builds head-to-head -head in a popularity poll, where we finally got to this video here, where I'm going to talk about the five builds that came out on top. This is also a friendly competition between me and my my friend and friend of the channel, Glue Boy, where we picked our sets of five and we pitted them against each other in a popularity contest to see who won. It was me. But these builds are really, really cool. And I did learn a lot from Lancer. Now, these are some pretty intense builds, as a lot of these builds are for level license level 12 Lancer pilots. So there's a lot going on. But if you want to see some very interesting end game builds, well, then go ahead and stay tuned. And actually, let's go ahead and get started. So starting off, we have one of my favorite builds, which is going to be the burning wheel here. All this art is done through retrograde minis. I'll leave a link to that in the description. We're not sponsored or anything, but it's a very cool site where you get to make some really great pixel art versions of your mechs for Lancer specifically. So they got a lot of really cool things there. And this is the kind of stuff that you can do. As you can see here, the Burning Wheel is such an interesting build, but let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? So what licenses do you need to get this build going? This is gonna use three of the Tortuga, one of the Black Witch, two of the Baylor, two of the Genghis, one of the Lich, two of the Iskander, and one of the Kobold. And this is using primarily the Genghis frame, which is a very good frame for the build. And it is a very interesting build. One of my, it was actually my favorite build from the contest in general, from the winners. And it's, its concept is very cool. So its primary function is to get to a position on the battlefield and to create essentially a very terrible like zone around it for enemies to be in using the Baylor's swarm body specifically and the Genghis's explosive vents. And essentially you just want to get enemies as close to you as possible and then just con consistently dump damage on them with your various systems while also using some other of your actual weapons for more long range enemies who are staying kind of out of your range or using the fuel rod gun to hopefully proc your explosive vents and as well do damage to enemies who are within your kill zone. So the primary things you need to really focus on when you're using this build is, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the system since they play a big part. So system wise, you're going to get hyper dense armor, which is what you're picking up from the Tortuga. It makes it so that any attacks from outside a three hex range you get resistance to, which is incredibly useful in this build. In addition, we're taking explosive events, as I mentioned before, from the Genghis. Swarm body from the Baylor. And if you're not familiar with swarm body, this allows you to essentially create a zone around you that grows in size and damage as long as you hold still and you don't move. Forge clamps from the Cobalt will just help you from being knocked around or knocked prone, which your whole thing is not moving. So preventing yourself from moving and also just kind of rooting yourself in place will make you very hard for the enemies to work with. And they'll have to try to go around you if that is even possible. Wandering Nightmare also adds to our annoying burst range around our mech, creating a zone that if enemies start their turn in it, are going to have to make a system save or become slowed, which is very particularly nasty. And that is in addition to the fact that while they're in the zone, they can't take reactions and they take two heat if they fail the aforementioned save. Pharaoh Slash from our one point in Black Witch is going to help us drag enemies into our zone, which is very important as, you know, we do want them to be around us. And of course, personalizations, very 
commonly picked if you have a remaining parent left over. And this is mostly just to give us some extra hull for the build. Speaking about hull, this particular build stat wise has a six in its hull. No points in agility. We don't want to move anyway, so that's not a big deal. A two in its systems to get us some extra system points and six in its engineering. And this is to further increase our heat cap, but more importantly, to increase the number of limited use systems we have, like the fuel rod gun. So complementing these systems, the core bonuses this particular build uses is going to be the lesson of the open door. This is such a save heavy build, especially with the Pharaoh Slash and the Wandering Nightmare, particularly being focused on saves. So having as high of a save as possible is very important. Also, we take universal compatibility. Since this particular build roots us in place, even though we do have hyperdense armor to kind of help survive as long as possible, this will give us pretty much a full heal as soon as we pop our system. And it allows us to, when we want to over uh, go over our stress limit for our heat and instantly relieve all our heat because we're a Genghis, so we wouldn't even take a stress damage. And of course, proccing our explosive vents yet again. Speaking on our heat, heatfall coolant systems is really important for this build as we're probably going to be overcharging a lot since this requires a lot of setup. I mean, you need to move into position, and this is not a particularly fast build, having a speed of only three, so boosting as necessary. On top of that, we need to set up our Wandering Nightmare, our Swarm Body, our Forge Clamps, and our using our Hyperdense Armor, so we need to use as many actions as possible, as quickly as possible, and overcharging, and ensuring that our overcharge does not go over a D6 is very important for that. And last but not least, reinforced frame. And this just ensures that we have as much HP as possible, which is, you know, very handy since we're not going to be moving a whole bunch. So kind of I mentioned a little bit earlier, the weapons we want to use is we have the fuel rod gun, which we comes with a uh, nuclear cavalier. We have the unraveler, the mort mortar and the gravity gun. And something you might notice is a lot of these guns have some pretty significant range. And actually, the gravity gun kind of helps draws enemies even closer as any enemies that fail the save for the gravity gun in particular will be drawn closer, probably getting into Pharaoh slash range, which does indeed allow us to then pull the enemy potentially into our swarm body, which is very important and probably our waking nightmare as well. The mortars just are very handy you know, arcing over any cover. So even if it's a more open battlefield, we don't have to necessarily worry about hard cover. And the Unraveler is just really good for some consistent damage thanks to its reliable too. The talents that this build uses in particular is Nuclear Cavalier 3, which this just allows us to make use of the heat that we're constantly building up and also allows us to use the Fuel Rod Gun so that we can potentially dump extra damage and our explosive vents on enemies who are close as long as our heat hasn't gotten too high. Heavy Gunner is very particularly good in this build because even if the enemies are generally outside of our normal range, this allows us to use reactions to hit them when it's not our turn. Really great for use with our gravity gun as this will pull enemies to us. The other talents are not that great, but they do still add to the build with Grease Monkey. Uh, three points into Grease Monkey three points into Prospector, and Prospector is actually very, very important as it allows us to tunnel out to a range within five, which our mech is particularly slow, so that's particularly good. Uh, Pancretti, which does allow us to charge an enemy and as a free action using, I believe, up to twice our speed, so really good to get into position. And then Siege Specialist, which is just really, really good for getting rid of any annoying obstacles that might be in our way. Oh, and my apologies. This build was done by Lion of Comer, one of the several contestants that we have. This contest did have a lot of repeat contestants as players put in multiple builds. Honestly, we didn't even have enough total participants to really make sure that everyone got a unique one. So if you see some of these same names again, you're probably, you know, that it was just the way the contest had to turn out, unfortunately. Speaking about names that we're going to see a lot, Svan here, 
uh, did a lot of builds in this. I believe they got at least two of the winning builds as well. And this is their build Stake Driver, which is the next build that we're going to be doing. Uh, a very fun Stortebecker build, if you uh, are very familiar with the Raleigh license. This is such an interesting one. So let's go ahead and take a look at the, the licenses, shall we? So this is a very simple one. This one has three in the Raleigh, three in the Nelson, three in the Tortuga, and three in the Caliban. This is a very IPS North Star based build, which is very interesting and potentially very thematic. Uh, we did have some lore bits with some of these builds. So if you want to see some of these builds, or if you want to see all of these builds, actually, you can join our Discord down in the description down below. Uh, feel free. We try to host contests every so often, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to do some giveaways as well. So if you're interested in that, check it out down below. But anyway, the stake driver build here uses the Stortebecker as its core build using the Raleigh license. And its systems is the Roland Chamber, which is a very huge part of this build. Obviously, since it's using the Stortebecker, it uses hyperdense armor. This is a kind of close range using the Catalyst Hammer and the Cannibal from the Caliban. So hyperdense armor makes a ton of sense. This also uses the normal GMS systems, the rapid burst jump jet system, which is really good. It allows us to get to an enemy anywhere they are, no matter what. And we also have armament redundancy, another GMS system. And this allows us to once per battle, essentially, or once per full repair, we can ignore the effects of weapon destruction during system trauma which this build is very, very dependent on its weapons, being the Stortebecker, if you're unfamiliar. Its general abilities focus around the swapping between uses between melee loading weapons and ranged loading weapons. So getting either of our weapons destroyed is a very bad time for us. So that being the case, this is actually a pretty mandatory system for this particular build. And... They didn't put it here on the systems part, but it is one of the additional ones they added. They also added the thermal charge to their catalytic hammer. And so let's get into the weapon. So their primary weapon and the main thing you want to be doing with this build is getting as close into range as possible so that we can use our catalytic hammer as much as possible in addition to the HHS-155 Cannibal, a big badass shotgun now both of these are also using a couple of our core systems here the Cadillac hammer is going to be using overpower caliber it's going to be one of our primary heavy damage things with thermal charge overpower cal uh, caliber and the Cadillac hammer's effect in itself it can potentially do an additional 3d6 bonus damage which is absolutely nuts and with the cannibal, it already does a lot of damage, so we are going to put auto stabilizing hard points on it as well. And considering that we have an extra flex mount available, the author decided to take a deck sweeper automatic shotgun just to give us a, a decent range option, just in case any of our other weapons are currently unloaded. Though they did say that you could probably just take another catalytic -like hammer if you really, really wanted to, which is honestly not a bad idea. And since we went ahead and talked about some of the core bonuses already, the remaining ones that we've added here to the list is the Gigas Frame. Gigas Frame, I'm actually not familiar how this one is pronounced. And this is really important for the build because it does increase the threat of our melee weapons, which means our Calic Hammer or Hammers is going to have a much bigger range, which is going to be very handy. And another familiar one to a prior our prior build, Reinforced Frame, for some extra HP. Speaking about hull points, the stats that we're using for this particular build is 6 points in hull, 4 in agility, 0 points in systems, and 4 in engineering. A pretty decent spread out with no major caps. The, the extra HP makes a lot of sense. This is a frame that is going straight into battle. It doesn't have a lot of armor, so it's going to need to be able to survive. In addition, the four agility is going to bump up this mech speed to seven, which is pretty insane. And the four to our engineering is going to be able to give us some a couple extra uses 
of some of our limited systems. The talents that we're using for this particular build is three in combined arms, which makes a lot of sense. Being a starter backer, we're going to be swapping a lot between range and melee. So this is going to help out a lot, especially with the potential accuracy bonuses for our Hannibal, since it's an inaccurate weapon anyway. And if we double barrel it, we definitely want the ability to at least neutral out our penalties. Skirmisher is going to give us some soft cover as long as we're up at close and personal with the enemy, which is very important. So it's something that's really good to have. And as well, we're going to be able to maneuver around enemies, getting to the more juicy, weak enemies in the background. So things like Lockbreaker and Weave will allow us to hopefully avoid any enemies that we don't necessarily wish to engage with. Duelist just makes a ton of sense since we're primarily using the Cadillac Hammer for our major damage source. So that being the case, the plus one accuracy to your first melee attack in our round and the reloading weapon. So it's not like we're going to be using a bunch anyway. Makes a lot of sense. And we actually need to get two points in Duelist so that we can pick up Blade Master. Just makes a ton of sense. We're going to be using love our melee weapon anyway in the build. So the use of that Blade Master die is going to be very, very good. Couple points in Infiltrator, more similar reasons, just the ability to move through enemy squares, get to the enemies in the back, and two points in Leader. This just gives us some additional reaction since we don't have a lot in this build, allowing us to aid our team in addition to a lot of other things. So primarily how this build is supposed to work is you're, you run up, get as close to an enemy as possible, you smash them with the Cadillac Hammer, and then depending on your like whether you crit or not we're going to be using a lot of these Stortebeckers base traits primarily it's dynamic reload if we manage to get a crit or if necessary true silver if the enemy manages to have some resistance to the types of weapons we're doing this is also going to be using a lot of the passive core systems like reprise and renewal reprise is really good if we manage to get off one of our dynamic reloads which we can guarantee with true silver if there's no enemies with resistance. And renewal will be just a really good setup so that we can alternate every turn between using our Cadillac Hammer and the Hannibal Shotgun. Overall, this is such a fun build, very interesting, and it's very much a very powerful starter Becker build that gets right into the fray of enemies. Thanks to hyper dense armor, you don't have to worry about long range necessarily. And you're so fast that the slower back range or back line mechs are going to have a hard time getting to you. And with all our ways to avoid engagement and the ability to even move through enemy uh, spaces, as it were, we there's not a lot that can really stop us, which makes this a very terrifying build for any of the squishies that the hard frontliners are trying to protect. The next build is a particular favorite for this particular competition. And this is going to be Smell of Napalm, a very, very fun build. This particular build uses uh, two ranks into the Sherman, one in the Genghis, three in the Tokugawa, three in the Manticore, two in the Atlas, and one in the Black Witch. And this uses the Sherman, actually, which is very funny because you would think the Genghis potentially, but there's only one ranking Genghis. But yeah, this uses the Sherman and predominantly because this build actually heavily uses energy damage. Uh, speaking on that, the main core of this particular build is use of the Lucifer class NHP. This particular NHP very heavily favors energy weapons. So obviously with the core integrated uh, ZAF4 solid core for the Sherman, it's a very good weapon to pair up with the Lucifer. And since the Sherman has a pretty good heat cap right out, this is a really good mix because the Sherman has such a high heat cap and there's so many good ways for us to increase our heat. This allows us, especially uh, to get into the danger zone, this allows us to very easily do a massive amount of damage to enemies as long as we're using our energy weapons. This particular build is also not afraid to get up close and personal with the enemies. So we're also going to be using the lightning generator from the Manticore. This is going to just guarantee that all adjacent enemies to us take at minimum energy damage every round, which is really, really good, though. And it does increase our heat. And if we're in the danger zone, which we're going to have a pretty high danger zone, 
this is going to allow us to make it four armor piercing energy damage, meaning just being adjacent to us is going to be pretty scary. We also have the redundant systems upgrade so that we are never going to necessarily be a major threat of hitting our heat cap. If we ever are, we can just spend a quick action to stabilize. And this build does invest a little bit in the engineering so that we're going to be able to do it at least a couple of times. And to pair perfectly with that, we're going to take the explosive vents from the Genghis, which is actually going to allow us to vent and destroy all the enemies who are adjacent to us, which works out pretty perfectly considering it mixes very well with the lightning generator. Also, we took the Pharaoh Slash, which uh, another familiar one that you might have seen from the uh, our first build from the Black Witch to make sure the enemies stay as close to us as we can manage. And as well, this all pairs perfectly with the weapons that we have set up for this particular build, most of them being pretty close range. We have the Fuel Rod Gun in addition to the ZF4 Solid Core, as I mentioned before. So that's really good. Uh, with our flex mount, we have a segment knife and catalyst pistol. This is not our primary fire, but it is something that we're going to be using pretty reliably in tandem with the heavy mount on this, which is going to be using the Krokotoa Thermobaric Flamethrower, which is it does a little bit of energy damage. And that's perfect because with our Lucifer class NHP, that little bit of energy damage is going to spike massively. And we're going to do a lot of burn in tandem with it, which is really, really good. Now, we also, from the Atlas, we did take a couple points in Atlas, have you noticed? We have the Crown Rifle. This allows us to shoot a harpoon at one of the enemies and, as a reaction, try to reel them in. We want enemies to be close to us so that we can proc them with our lightning generator or get in range of our flamethrower. So it makes perfect sense. Now, stat-wise, I kind of alluded to it a little bit. We have four points in hole. Zero agility, we're not moving that fast. We do have four points in systems and eight or six points in our engineering. The four points in systems, we have a lot of very expensive systems here, so it was very necessary. And the engineering maxed out as much as possible to get the most out of our limited use systems, predominantly our fuel rod gun and our redundant systems upgrade. For our core bonuses, we're taking stasis shielding. We are pushing our mech trying to be in the danger zone as much as possible and with the Sherman's unique ability to whenever we would clear heat to go only to half of our heat, we're very likely to take stress damage. So with the use of stasis shielding, it will allow us to, when we do take stress damage, take uh, regain resistance to all damage until the start of our next turn. So something that's potentially really good and also helps us against particular burn builds. Since our E defense is not the best, it's not terrible, but it's really not our strong suit in this particular build. And even if it does come down to that, we also are taking adaptive reactors. So if we have the repairs, we can spend two repairs whenever we stabilize our mech, which we can do as a quick action to clear that stress damage as well, which is actually really handy for this build. And it makes us very, very adaptable to even enemies that are very focused on pressuring us with tech actions to increase our heat. Also, another familiar one, Lesson of the Open Door. We do a lot of saves, especially when it comes to the use of our explosive vents. So that being the case, it's something that just makes a lot of sense on the build. And we actually are taking all theater movement, which does give us some movement options thanks to some of our uh, particular talents. Speaking on talents, the talents that we're taking in this build is Ace 3, a very interesting one. And honestly, Ace is very good. It allows us to, as long as we're flying, we get a plus one accuracy on our agility checks. And anytime an attack misses us, we can fly up to two spaces in a direction as a reaction. This does allow us to, as long as we're flying at the end of the round, to ensure that we're moving at least a little bit more, a little bit more. And this paired off with supersonic does mean that if we have a if we use a overcharge to spin up our thrusters, then we can use supersonic, which does give us a lot of movement options, allowing us to essentially move also in addition with supersonic if we're not starting in combat. Essentially, if we're starting a, a battle, we can move boost so that we're flying. 
and then use supersonic so that we can fly even further out if we have an ally who's moving in that direction. Pretty good, and this does allow us to get a sentry an extra boost out of the round, even if we overcharge boost. So it does provide a lot of movement, and this can get us right into it right away. So honestly, ace, not bad. And it did, in, in addition, whenever we boost while flying, we can boost an additional D6 spaces. That extra movement is going to be very handy because our mech is pretty slow at a speed of only three. We have the return of Nuclear Cavalier 3, just really good for any mechs that are working particularly in the danger zone. And as long as we're in the danger zone, we do some extra damage, which along with Lucifer means that our flamethrower is very, very scary. We also have three ranks in Vanguard. This makes it so that our close course combat weapons, which most of them are, gain a plus one accuracy. And this can even allow us to ignore things like soft and hard cover with as long as the enemy is within range three, since we want to be close to them. You know, even if they manage to step back and throw up some kind of barrier or something, it's not going to be enough. And Semper Vigilo is going to allow us to shoot any enemies with our flamethrower if they even dare to try to get around us in any way, even if they ignore engagement. So this does make us a pretty big roadblock for a lot of enemies that value their life. We also have Combined Arms 3, which I actually did forget. We also have a flex mount that has the Segment Knife and the Catalyst Pistol from the Manticore and GMS uh, inversely, I guess. GMS and Manticore, respectively. There we go. Uh, which gives us some really good options if the Flamethrower is not good for whatever reason or just as a potential full barrage in close range since our fuel, uh, in case our fuel rod gun is currently out or we just don't want to use our crowd rifle which honestly we probably wouldn't in addition being able to ignore the difficulty for engagement is also very handy we also are taking a couple points into grease monkey which was something we saw a little bit earlier there it's not very important but this does allow us to at least more easily replace our limited systems which is very very handy for the build and a very surprising one uh, for this one is one rank into Hunter to take the lunge so that once per round when we're using our auxiliary weapon, we can fly up to three spaces directly to them. This is actually one of the reasons why having the segment knife and the catalytic pistol is very good because we can fly up and use them if necessary. And since the catalyst pistol is also a cone, this can be very good in a lot of situations. And this movement er, ignores engagement, so this allows us to position better in some combat situations. Overall, not a bad set of talents, and this makes for an incredibly dangerous enemy if they get up close to you. So everyone wants to keep pretty far away, and we're going to consistently do either burn damage or a massive amount of energy damage using very heavily the Lucifer NHP. Overall, smell napalm in the morning is very, very good. It's a... I, it's a very scary one. I wouldn't want to go up against it personally. Now, for our fourth round winner, there was a little bit of issues with how the community poll ended up working out. So I do want to make special mention of E-Tree, and I'll do a, an honorable mentions for all the other builds that didn't quite make it into the video. But the E-Tree specifically was one that barely lost out, and it was very kind of weird. So I do want to at least do a call out. It's a very fun Atlas build. It's a very chunky Atlas build very heavily relying on getting as much hull points as possible and mixing that in with its Jaeger dodge and duelist for the ability to essentially get resistance as much as possible, increasing the amount of hull points essentially this mech has. And in addition, this heavily uses a chain axe with thermal charge on it, which is pretty good and overpower caliber. In addition, it has a very interesting setup of using the slag cannon with the uncle class from the Raleigh, which allows you to essentially either create terrain for you to bounce around as, as an Atlas, or to knock enemies prone, which is just very good. So overall, a very cool build, very, very interesting, and I would not have been surprised if it had made it into the fourth rank, uh, fourth winning slot instead. But unfortunately, it did not, but I wanted to at least give a call out for it. It's a really, really cool build. Please go check it out in the Discord if you get the chance. Yet another build by Svan here. We have the Hammer Time, a build after my own heart. 
I absolutely love control defender types, and this is a very, very good one. This one it uses is the White Witch 3 ranks into that license. It uses the Vlad 3, the Drake 2, the Nelson 1, and the Minotaur 3. The Minotaur doesn't really play much of a part in this build and is only used for, guess what, Lesson of the Open Door. As might as well go ahead and start with the talents this time. This one uses Lesson of the Open Door, as I mentioned before, to increase its saves, which is going to be forcing a ton of saves as its primary function is to lock enemies down. We also have to see a return of Reinforced Frame for that extra HP. Uh, universal Compatibility, which is insanely good, and another return is something that just when we use our active power for the White Witch, which is pretty good, we'll also get our HP all the way up to max as well and improved armament to give us an additional weapon slot. Speaking on weapon slots, this uses some very, very sensible mixes that are very dangerous together. We have the Pharaoh Fluid Lance, which is very good as a melee option for locking enemies down. We have the Impaler Nail Gun for a slightly longer distance range and a pretty decent threat. In addition, it has a crit hit, or when it hits the target, anytime it hits a target, it's a whole save or they become immobilized until the end of a turn. You can see there's a lot of immobilization here. And the retort loop as a, a white witch in general with a lot of the systems that we're about to go over. We have a lot of ways to get damage and thus make our retort loop do a bunch of extra damage. Speaking on, let's go ahead and talk about our systems here. So we have Kesmus's razor, a very consistently good one so that allows us to guard our allies. Uh, Speaking on that, we also have the Argonaut Shield and the Aegis Shield Generator, which the Aegis Shield Generator is particularly good for us since we're playing a White Witch. We don't have a lot of armor starting out, but with the use of the Shield Generator, we can mitigate some of that damage so that we can continuously increase our armor until it is a massive plus six armor, which is really, really good and makes the White Witch a very particularly strong mech indeed and thanks to the use of the argonaut shield we can block an ally taking half of the damage as well so that's something that's very good we also have the bulwark mods from the nelson which helps us to get around any kind of difficult terrain meaning that it's very easy for us to get where we need to as we need to and the white witch being a particularly fast mech indeed and with some investment in agility we can get pretty much anywhere we are needed which is very very huge we also took Armament Redundancy in this particular one, which is a little bit questionable. Honestly, I think there's a lot of already good lockdown in this build, so it's not 100% necessary, but hey, we're a tank anyway. We're likely to take system trauma. So that being the case, eh, for a single point, it's really not that bad. And of course, personalizations to give us some extra HP. And because the White Witch has so much starting systems, we also are taking the Caltrop Launcher, and the web snare and the penning spire to create all kinds of either area control or enemy lockdown or more enemy lockdown. Penning spire is just very, very solid for just locking yourself and an enemy in. And if they manage to hit us, then they can actually get away. But until they do, they're stuck with us here. And also due to the white, which is basic function, when it becomes immobilized, it just gains resistance to kinetic damage thanks to rooted. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of good ways to root the enemy and ourselves, or just choose to be rooted with whatever enemy is near us and just gain resistance and also cannot be knocked back or knocked prone, which is essentially as good as uh, Forge Camps, which is really awesome. For our stats that we're taking with this particular mech, we have six points in hull, makes a ton of sense for the White Witch. We are taking two points in agility to get some extra speed. Two points in systems because we have a lot of systems smushed here into this mech and four in engineering, mostly to get those plus two limited slots for things like our our sympathetic shield generator. And in addition, uh, leaves us with a good amount of HP. We got 32 whole points and seven speed, which is pretty good. Now for the talents, we took Duelist 3. Which makes a lot of sense since we're going to be using a lot of the Ferrofluid Lance or Ferrofluid Lancia in this build. 
combined arms so that we don't get any penalties for locking an enemy down and shooting them with our impaler nail gun, so it makes a ton of sense. We also have Vanguard 3 to help improve the use of our nail gun, and in addition, the Semper Vigilo, as I mentioned before, is really good for helping lock down enemies, especially with the Impaler Nail Gun, since if they fail the whole save, they just become immobilized. Also, as a defender, we gotta take some House Guard, three ranks in House Guard to help defend our allies. It's a really, really good system, one I particularly enjoy a lot. And Exemplar, another really good one to help defend our allies by use, use of the Valiant Aid action and dueling enemies, which is another great way to lock enemies off by giving them a massive penalty to their difficulty to attack any of our allies. Overall, an insanely great defender that is capable of locking enemies down and allowing us to throw aid to our allies as necessary with the use of the Argonaut shield or the Aegis shield generator. We're able to make sure our allies don't take a bunch of damage with the use of the... Universal compatibility can boost our HP all the way up to max, which after a few rounds of being shot, the enemies will have be crying as our armor is now super high and our HP is all the way back up. Overall, a very, very fun Defender build. Has all the parts of Defender I really like and uses some of my favorite licenses. I'm very glad that this particular build won, and it's definitely one of my favorites. And before we get to the last winner, I know this video has gone on a little long, but you know, I definitely want to give props to the various individuals who joined the contest and their particular builds. First off, we have Hotshot by Michelangelo Falconeri, friend of the channel, a close friend of mine personally, a really great ra uh, Raleigh build that, you know, uses a bunch of guns. We also have Nope, another one by Svan, which, you know... It was it, they were two of the same 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 creators builds going up against each other. Uh, it's a Gorgon build and it was so great. Such a such an interesting build. I love Gorgon. It, it, it's such an, a scary mech. We also have Yo Boy yet again uh, for Michelangelo Falconeri went up against Mel Napalm. So unfortunately, I love Lancaster builds, but it just went up against a really aesthetically cool mech. So. Unfortunately, our Lancaster boy did not win, but it was a lot closer than I was expecting. And again, you can't just you can't say no to having a good Lancaster on the team. So your boy was definitely a very fun one. I already mentioned Itri from a before. Absolutely love this art for it, by the way. Very, very cool mech. And the last one that lost out to our actual fifth round was Meep Meep. This one was done by... Oi man, and it's actually a Nelson build, which I was super surprised by because I'm not a big Nelson fan myself. But this is a pretty scary build, and it just imagine a, an invisible Nelson that's super fast and always on top of you, incredibly hard to hit. Meep Meep was surprisingly a very fun build, despite you know the weird kind of naming convention. But that does leave us to our actual fifth round winner, and the final build premiered here in this particular video which is going to be angry bees yeah a very fun build it's a swallowtail build no less and i actually really like this one as well due to its use of nexus weapons in fact it uses a lot of nexus weapons we'll actually get into that it comes with an integrated weapon thanks to the core bonus integrated weapon uh and it uses a nex nexus light weapon uh and this one was done by Lion of Khmer. I, I don't remember if I said that. So, you know, if I did, or if I didn't, then here we go. If not, I just edited this part out. Uh, but yeah, so the integrated weapon with a light nexus is very interesting because every time you shoot with this integrated weapon, you just can get not, not sorry. Anytime you get once per round, you fire with another weapon, you can fire with this one. So bees and we have the black spot targeting laser and a, a light nexus again, though this mount was retrofitted using the mount retrofitting core bonus. So, you know, laser pointer, more bees, pretty good. And then we have an ox ox mount with, you guessed it, more light nexus, double light nexus for more bees. We get to shoot a lot of bees in a round, potentially five or six bees, depending. 
every round. Really, really cool. It's not every round necessarily, but a lot of rounds. So yeah, and since we talked about some of the core bonuses, as I mentioned, we had the integrated weapon, we have mount retrofitting, and we have, of course, a return of Lesson of the Open Door, because we definitely have a lot of save-based things in our systems, and Heatfall Coolant System, another returner, and really good for mechs that like to overcharge, and this mech definitely does, as it likes to shoot lots of bees. So every time we can overcharge to skirmish yet again, more bees. Just really, really great. Speaking on systems, we have the, well, actually, let's look at the license levels, like completely spaced on the licenses. So this uses a lot from the IPS North Star Kid. We have three ranks in that. We have one rank in the Barbarossa. We have two ranks in the Genghis, two ranks in the Goblin, and two ranks in the Kobold, and two ranks in the Swallowtail, which is the core mech of this build. As for the light or as for the systems, we have the auto cooler from the Genghis, which is going to be very good since we're going to be probably overcharging a lot. So having auto cooler is very, very good. And in addition, we're not going to be moving a lot. So the auto cooler is actually very solid. From the kid, we're taking the Forge-2 sub altern squad, which allows us to create a emplacement that we can use as like a defense post, which is very, very handy. And we're actually mixing that with another from the kid, the Omnibus Plate, which does allow us to kind of have an expanded zone that also we can easily jump in and out of. Very, very cool. I love this idea. We also are taking the, the horror underscore us uh, system upgrade too. This provides for us the two very defensive tech actions, the construct ideal image and construct false idol. This just helps further make our mech very hard to nail down out here in our little treehouse that we've made with our emplacements. We also have Seismic Ripper from Cobalt to destroy any cover that the enemies might be using to get away from our bees. And in addition, we have Siege Stabilizers from the Barbarossa that allows us to extend the range of our Light Nexuses, which makes them up to a 15, which is pretty massive. Now, speaking on the talent here, a big one is Prospector, the ability to dig and create a new hole. hole to another location allows us to essentially set up other locations that we can set up our little mounted uh, emplacements, essentially, that we can easily jump in between as necessary. Very, very interesting, a very interesting way to use this particular build. In addition, we are using three ranks into Brutal, which even if we do miss with one of our shots, Relentless is essentially going to give us an increase in accuracy. And this keeps going up until we hit, which increases very heavily the chances of us critting. That mixed with Sentimane, which, you know, if any of you are a Nexus user, you know what Sentimane does. And whenever you crit with your Nexus weapons, you just utterly destroy them. We're taking three ranks in Sentimane, which gives us a potential to on crit, impair and slow, shred, and, or sorry, uh, shred and then our choice of either impair and slow or to reduce their sight shred a bunch of enemies around or make them take a burn sentiment is very very good with this nexus weapon and since we have such massive range it just works it works almost too well it's very scary we're also taking crack shot so we can stabilize our our accuracy with steady aim to better hit enemies increasing our accuracy yet again with all the accuracy bonuses we're getting, we can also zero in, which is really good because it allows us to take a difficulty, which we're probably countering anyway, to deal extra D6 bonus damage. And since we're using a lot of Nexus light weapon, we're not doing it very high. This build doesn't work super well against heavy armor targets. So this is a really good way to get around that. And watch this allows us to on critical hit yet again with a, a rifle we're able to do some serious debuffs by targeting one of the enemy's locations on their body. And because we're using predominantly auxiliary weapons in this build, we're going to be taking three ranks into Gunslinger, which works perfectly because anytime we fire for the first round with a auxiliary weapon, we get a plus one accuracy. 
We also get the return fire action, which already, uh, if we're not likely to get hit because with the Swollen Tail, we have a trait that allows us to, if as long as we don't move, turn invisible, which is pretty good. But even if they do, we have the ability to shoot back with one of our auxiliary weapons. And also a big important one is I kill with my heart. We're going to be firing this off almost every round as long as nothing is bothering us. Uh, we pretty much get our prime this every round as long as we're overcharging into it. And this does juice up by our, our auxiliary damage by 2d6. Again, making it pretty good even against heavy armored opponents. We're also taking two points in Tactician, which allows us to aid any of our allies that we're, we're helping shoot down with our bees from massive distances. And the big one actually for this one is Solar Backdrop. This actually once per round gives us an accuracy on any range attack made while we're at a higher elevation. Thanks to the Forge Dash 2, we're making an emplacement that is three hexes high. So that being the case, we're very often going to be at a higher elevation, meaning Solar Backdrop is going to go off a lot. Now, finally, let's talk about the stats here. We have six points in hull, very common you're seeing in a lot of these, and that's just to give us as many H uh, hull points as possible, especially since the Swallowtail does not have a lot of hull starting out. We also are going to be taking four points in agility so that we can at least get a little bit of evasion, not a ton, but a, a decent enough amount that even if we are hit through our invisibility somehow, we might still not get hit. Two points in systems to get some of the the systems that we put into it and two points in engineering to get at least one more limited use from our various systems that you know like the the forge dash two or the omnibus plates and yeah angry bees all it does is just just it makes a tree house it harasses enemies from massive range either doing massive debuffs to them or doing some pretty decent damage and overall, a very interesting use of a lot of different licenses. Overall, this particular contest has opened my eyes to the various different things that can be done in Lancer. So hopefully this video has been informative for you as, as much as it was for me. Also, hopefully this encourages a lot of you to join our community down in the, the Discord that links below, where we talk all things tabletop, and it's just the place to be. As well, if you like this kind of content or if you want to see more content on, you know, TTRPG stuff in general or Lancer, then I recommend leaving a like so other people get a chance to see it and subscribing, which gives you a chance to hopefully see it on your dash. But that's going to be it for me. Thank you all so much for watching. Good luck with your games. Leave the bad luck to me and I'll see you all next time. Bye.